Hello, in this panel discussion, Dr. Horowitz, Dr. Peterson, Dr. Dempsey and I will be discussing treatment options for Lyme disease. We'll be speaking from our experience and everyone has a depth of knowledge that they're eager to share. In full disclosure, none of us are members or represent the Infectious Disease Society of America, although some of us are members of ILADS. So we'll be discussing treatment. Unfortunately, as we all know, there's not as much to know as we wish we knew about treatment. There's currently no proven treatments or FDA approved therapies for chronic Lyme disease or persistent symptoms with Lyme disease. And we hope that rigorous uh, research and sharing our experiences today will help um, put some light on, on what we do and don't know. So let's start with an overview of treatment um, and the multitude of recommendations out there. These can be bewildering. We know that it's confusing sometimes and we're hoping to shed some light on that. Again, there's no FDA approved uh, treatment for chronic Lyme disease or post-treatment Lyme disease. And because of that, a lot of what we'll be talking about today are use of medicines in what's called an off-label setting. They're drugs that are approved for other indications, but not necessarily um, for Lyme disease. In addition, other uh, medications um, aren't even, um, or other remedies aren't even um, under the uh, scrutiny of the FDA and may be supplements or herbs that don't go up for FDA approval. So all of these things are, uh, are what we'll be discussing today. We're gonna put this in the context of the unique time points of Lyme disease, starting from the tick bite through acute, subacute infection, and then chronic uh, infection. So time points are important. And we're gonna start off actually with what to do with uh, tick bites. And you know, we all know that the sooner you get a tick off, the better, but there's a lot of nuances and other information about how to approach tick bites. And Dr. Horowitz is gonna help uh, speak about that at this time. Thank you, John. So the most important points to keep in mind with tick bites is the type of tick that you're getting, whether it's a female Exodes deer tick, um, or whether my, you might be having a dog or a wood tick, which can transmit other infections, or even a lone star tick, uh, which can transmit alpha-gal, um, tularemia, and many other infections. So the first thing is to recognize the tick. The second thing is we do advise people sending out the tick uh, to different places like health departments, technology in Colorado, to evaluate what's in the tick because as far as treatment, it depends on what is in the tick and what you're going to take antibiotic prophylactic wise. So for example, uh, in five minutes, you can get Borrelia hermsii relapsing fever. In 10 minutes, it's been shown with tick bites that you can get different rickettsial species. And we know within 15 minutes, you can get Powassan virus, which in 10 to 15% can cause neuroinvasive disease and death. So for that reason, and including, you can get, of course, Ehrlichia, anaplasma, Rocky Mountain spotted fever with ticks, which can be deadly. In one to 3% of anaplasma and ehrlichia, um, you can get deadly infections. And in Rocky Mountain spotted fever, six to 7% of children. So for that reason, tick prevention is very, very important and removing the tick properly. You wanna get under it with a tweezer and pull it straight out. Don't put any Vaseline or gasoline or anything on it. Um, and we do advise with people to use IR3535, especially in pregnant women. It's a product that's been shown to be safe in Europe for 35 years. I personally like picoridin 10 to 20% on my skin for mosquito and tick prevention. Uh, permethrin treated clothing can be effective in killing ticks. And finally, of course, using light colored clothing, uh, tucking your pants in your socks, doing tick checks when you come inside, uh, putting your clothes in a hot dryer for seven to 15 minutes can kill ticks. These are probably the most important things. And the last point I would like to make is some doctors are afraid to give doxycycline to pregnant women and children less than eight years old. And the CDC has now shown that seven to 10 days of doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day is safe in pregnancy and in childhood, you will not get teeth staining. Uh, if you don't do that, there have been fatal cases and that's why I'm highlighting this point. Thanks, Dr. Horowitz. Uh, so Dr. Horowitz has been talking about uh, prophylaxis of tick bites and now we're gonna go into actually treatment of disease and we'll start with acute and subacute disease. And I'll just briefly say there are some different recommendations about duration of therapy um, for acute and subacute disease, but the real uh, missing link here is needing a test of cure. We currently don't have a test that tells us that somebody's cured based on a blood test and this still hampers our ability to know what the adequate treatment is. 
Also add that um, in early disease, after early treatment, very little is talked about retreating in that early month or two of subacute disease. And I think a standard of care and practice often is um, allowed to retreat somebody in that early subacute phase if they don't respond to the initial um, defined course of therapy. So that's, that's another option. So let's move on now to the big topic today, which is chronic Lyme disease, persistent symptoms in Lyme disease, and talk a little bit about the differences in different approaches. The CDC website talks about um, and emphasizes symptomatic therapy. This would include things like pain management using gabapentin and other drugs. They also talk about um, the risks uh, of uh, antibiotic therapy for um, prolonged periods of time and, 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 and don't have specific recommendations about. So we want to dive into that and then talk to Dr. Peterson about how does that differ, that CDC website therapy, from what, um, what uh, ILADS and maybe other groups might re uh, recommend for now chronic long-term symptoms with Lyme disease. Sure. Thank you, John. Um, you know, your, your comment about that there's no test of cure, I think speaks to the point that really what, what's going on is we, we have, we're stuck in a paradigm from the 1830s, of sort of the infectious disease nature of this illness. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. And I think ILADS or the IDSA is to some extent entrenched in that idea. Um, we don't have a test of cure for uh, chicken pox either, um, but we know we're better. Right, and so I think that speaks to the fact that it really has a lot to do with how healthy is the host and how virulent is the uh, the infection. You know, Rich talks about how um, there's this three percent mortality um, with the Poisson. That's that's a big deal, right? You know, you're not cured because you're dead. Um, on the other hand, if you if you get treatment and you're not well, then you also know you're not cured. So, with ILADS, you know, the the uh, the guidelines I think are are good because they allow the patient to be treated until they're well. We wouldn't send someone home from the uh, hospital with pneumonia after a course of treatment. We would send them home after they're off the ventilator and they can breathe well. Um, similarly, a, a lengthier uh, time frame for antibiotic um, therapy for Lyme disease makes that same logical sense. Uh, it should to physicians. It certainly does um, to patients. Um, I think what we're looking for are, are better treatments with regard to how to kill these infections, but we should also be looking for better treatments with how to help the host, us individually as patients, uh, be able to uh, recover from the illness. Thank you. Um, so I know our audience is very anxious to hear about our experience, new therapies, things that may be being investigated. So Dr. Horwitz, can you tell us a little bit about your experience and research on, on new and evolving uh, emerging treatment options? Sure. So several years back when Ying Zhang had started talking about Lyme disease being a persister, and I think for those of us in the field who've been doing this for a long time, who reviewed the scientific literature, we knew that Lyme could persist. It's been shown clearly in mice and horses and dogs and macaque monkeys. Um, and there are certainly studies showing that if it goes into certain compartments in humans, uh, it can cause Lyme arthritis. It can get into the ligaments, the central nervous system, um, certain places like the intracellular compartment, where it's more difficult to treat. But when Ying Zhang talked about persisters, I went to the literature because years ago, of course, when I was doing my residency at Mount Sinai, we had seen a lot of patients with HIV who had, of course, persistent tuberculosis, mycobacterium infections. So I had always wanted to use uh, mycobacterium drugs because they're used for persisters. And I looked up Dapsone. And Dapsone had been used previously for leprosy with rifampin. And I decided because it has an effect on lowering inflammation, gets good penetration into the central nervous system, um, and it hits persisters to try it in Lyme. And we published our first trial on Dapsone back about four years ago in 100 patients looking at eight major Lyme symptoms using doxycycline, rifampin, and dapsone. And the therapy was effective except for headaches and that one from p-values. And then we published another study last year in 200 patients, a retrospective study on tetracyclines, rifampin, and dapsone using also biofilm agents like oregano oil, stevia, biocidin, seropeptase, and all eight major Lyme symptoms fatigue, musculoskeletal pain, neuropathy, sleep disorders, memory, concentration problem, mood, it all got better uh, with the therapy. And in the last several years, what's been exciting for me is ever since Ken Liegner published on disulfiram, 
which comes out of the work from uh, Stanford researchers and Kim Lewis, we started using also disulfiram as a persister drug, uh, found that it can be effective, although the Herxheimer reactions can be quite severe with this drug. And we now have three arms of a study with disulfiram alone, disulfiram doxyrifampin, as I did with Dapsone, and disulfiram rifampin Dapsone and disulfiram together, in other words, two persister drugs used at lower doses, as well as an arm of a study with double dose Dapsone. And I'm in the process of publishing uh, case studies on that right now. What it all comes down to is that the patients in our practice who are not co-infected with Babesia or Bartonella, those patients with just Lyme disease who've had other issues dealt with like immune deficiency, et cetera, if we used 100 of Dapsone twice a day for four to five weeks with doxycycline and rifampin, along with using glutathione and methylene blue to keep down methemoglobinemia, high-dose folic acid, both leucovorin and L-methylfolate, we have able to put people into remission for 24 to 30 months. Now, these are patients that were sick for 20 to 30 years that relapsed with classical cell wall, uh, intracellular drugs, round body drugs. So it's very exciting actually for me as a clinician because we are getting people better with these new persister drugs, but I do think we need a randomized control trial. Um, that would be very, very helpful to really see the effect of these new persister drugs and biofilm agents. Um, Rich, the CDC website talks a lot about the risks of antibiotic therapies or multiple drugs. How do you discuss the risk benefit kind of equation with patients and how do you um, try to minimize side effects with drugs? So we know with IV drugs like IV ceftriaxone, there is always a risk of infection and clots. And fortunately, ever since we discovered Dapsone therapy and disulfiram, we've not had to use IV therapy. I have maybe one or two patients a year now on IV therapy. So we don't usually have that problem. Oral antibiotics, on the other hand, can cause problems with antibiotic-associated diarrhea and yeast infections in the colon. So our approach is that we use at least three probiotics uh, somewhere between 60 to 80 billion twice a day, uh, different strains with Saccharomyces boulardii, which has been published to stop antibiotic-associated diarrhea. And we find that if people do sugar-free, yeast-free diets, take nystatin uh, with some of these biofilm agents like oregano oil, biocidin, monolaurin, they don't get a lot of yeast infections. We keep down the problems with the microbiome of the gut, um, and people tolerate the drugs actually quite well. Um, you will occasionally see problems with the white cell counts using drugs like uh, cephalosporins or Bactrim. You will occasionally see elevated liver functions, which resolve and go back to normal. And we support the liver using N-acetylcysteine, alpha-lipoic acid, glutathione, milk thistle. Uh, using this approach, we found that patients tolerate the protocols actually quite well. Um, and again, now that we're using much shorter term antibiotic therapy with Dapsone, um, these patients are not on antibiotics as long. So that's pretty much how they tolerate the therapies. Thank you. Dr. Peterson, antibiotics aren't the only thing in our toolkit. Um, some people don't need or don't want antibiotics. Can you help walk us through some of the non-antibiotic approaches to therapy? Sure. Um, uh, Rich brings up a great point about yeast. I think that's a good example of the host not being a particularly healthy person, and therefore they're more at risk for these bacteria. Um, I, I think gut health is probably the fundamental, most important thing that you can do to get well, regardless of what your problem is, Lyme or otherwise. And so th those very things that he just mentioned, like biocidin and loricidin, oregano oil, those are the sorts of things that are going to help your immune system, help your gut. Um, your immune system really resides in your gut. That's where stuff gets in and out of your body. So your gall, your gastric associated lymphoid tissue, your malt, your mucosally associated lymphoid tissue, a 70% of your, of your lymph system, um, uh, lymph nodes are in your gut. So if that gut is healthy, um, you, you then have a, an excellent microbiome, the bacteria that are supposed to be there. And you have the capacity then to um, fight against these uh, potentially pathologic or completely pathologic microbes like Lyme disease or any of the other co-infections. Um, reducing inflammation, that's probably the next, in my opinion, most important thing you can do. There's things like um, turmeric and ginger, um, but in my my favorite thing to reduce inflammation is to get the immune system to calm down because that's, that's the source of a lot of the inflammation. Um, so my personally 
preferred method of treating the immune system. Uh, aside from naltrexone, and I think everyone should be on naltrexone, or at least try to be on naltrexone to uh, improve the inflammatory response, but is a therapy called low-dose immunotherapy. Um, with immunotherapy, essentially, it's, it's like treating someone um, as though they had allergies. Um, we've done this for 100 years with allergies to environmental um, exposure to hay fever or, or cat dander. Um, well, our immune systems can overreact to microbes as well, whether that's yeast or a mold toxin um, or a microbe like Lyme or, or Babesia. And so you can give the person very tiny dilutions of the antigens on those same microbes and calm the immune system down so now it's not overreacting. I think by doing that, what you're doing is you're helping address the host itself and how well can it um, be colonized, if you will, with some of these microbes. Um, again, that sort of goes back to the idea of can we eradicate these infections or can we improve the host's ability to coexist with them? Um, then there's also all sorts of lifestyle things, good sleep, exercise. Um, I, I sort of describe exercise in three ways. You've got ex exercise for your parasympathetics, which would be yoga or tai chi, things that calm down the autonomic nervous system, allow your body to relax. And then cardiovascular exercise and weightlifting. Well, for a patient with chronic disease, by far the most important is that parasympathetic exercise, something that allows their body to relax. Um, so I think yoga and meditation is really important. And honestly, a spiritual practice is critically important. Um, we, we truly are mind, body, and spirit. And if we don't have a spiritual practice, we're, we're missing a third of what will make us healthy. Thank you. Dr. Dempsey, we've been talking a lot about the direct role of Borrelia burgdorferi and the infection, but another huge area is, is Borrelia infection a potential trigger for other associated disorders like mast cell activation? And does this play a role in chronic illness as well? Thank you, John. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, the numbers coming out of my uh, practice are something like greater than 80% of, of my patients with a history of chronic Lyme have evidence of mast cell activation syndrome. And mast cell targeted therapy can have a significantly positive effect on some of their persistent symptoms, particularly when you've already taken care of the underlying infection or you're treating along with treating the underlying infection. I mean, I think it's important to understand and what mast cells do in the body. I mean, they're very important cells. They're white blood cells. They're, they're part of the, the primitive immune system. They're really your first line against the environment and they're there to protect you. So everybody, whether they have Lyme or not, have mast cells. And if, uh, if their body is confronted with, uh, with a pathogen a, a, a infection, Lyme disease, Babesia, even COVID-19, their mast cells are going to get activated um, to protect them. And part of the activation is this sort of um, uh, explosion, releasing chemicals that mast cells make, and that and that explosion and release of chemicals is a, is a way of combating the the infection. It doesn't always work, but in normal conditions, the mast cells activate, try to do their job, and then they sort of reset. They do other things and they talk to the immune system in other ways. But the problem um, really is when the mast cells really become um, inappropriate. They react. Um, it, inappropriately, uh, continuously, um, with trigger or without trigger. They just become uh, dysfunctional. And um, in the case of Lyme disease, we see that some of these patients probably had a mast cell activation syndrome or, or a predisposition for it. Then they got infection and the infection brought it out. In other cases, they did not have any dysfunction, but the infection brought out this this um, dysfunction, and and it becomes um, you know a big part of the symptomatology that they they experience because mast cells are everywhere in the body. They're in all the tissue. They're not in the bloodstream um, where the other white blood cells are, but they're really there to, again, to, to protect you in all those different areas. So depending on where the mast cells are reacting or think they need to react is where a lot of the symptomatology can, can occur. So we see a lot of autonomic dysfunction in our patients. Is that linked to the mast cell activation? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we have more and more evidence um, supporting the role of mast cells um, 
both in uh, the effects on the nervous system, uh, particularly the autonomic nervous system in this case, but also in, in the role in autoimmunity. In some cases, um, dysautonomia or autonomic dysfunction may be an autoimmune condition. Um, and we believe that the, that the mast cells may be a driver in, in, that, in that case. Um, you know, mast cells basically um, engage in, in crosstalk among the cells in, in the different parts of the immune system system and they can they can actually speak to the the B cells in the in the immune system and tell them to produce antibodies and those antibodies um, then become can can be abnormal antibodies they can be antibodies that then sort of attack the body and the nervous system and we also know that mast cells basically reside in um, around every nerve fiber in the body and and they're there again as a, as a protective layer but but if the mast cells get activated, you can imagine that there's this crosstalk between the nerves and the mast cell. The mast cell releasing their mediators. Some of the mediators that they release, they're cytokines. Um, they're very inflammatory. They're, they're, can, they can act as neurotransmitters. So they can tell the nerves to, to, to send a signal. The nerves may, may send a, a abnormal signal. Um, so you, get, you can imagine you can get neuropathies um, and then yeah, uh, you know, we're talking here about autonomic dysfunction, which then could cause things like postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or POTS, uh, gastroparesis. These are things that we see very, very commonly in our tick-borne disease patients. Um, and, and what I have found in my practice is that while those conditions have treatments specifically um, uh, addressing those conditions like IVIG, and, and some other um, uh, therapies, I have found that mast cell targeted treatment, either along with those things or instead of those things, depending on the case, can be very helpful. Great. Um, Dr. Dempsey, um, you want to speak a little bit about SOT therapy at this point? Yeah, I mean, I'll just mention, thank you, John. I'll, I'll mention, um, you know, I, I completely agree with, with what everyone is saying, and, and Dr. Peterson did a, did a great um, overview of integrative therapies. I think it's just important to note, as we're talking about novel therapies, that there is this new treatment um, that is, is called supportive oligonucleotide therapy, or SOT, that was, I think, initially designed um, in the cancer, for, the, uh, for, for cancer in the cancer world, you know, is now being um, used in, in Lyme and tick-borne diseases. Um, we, we started using it. We have small numbers. I, we don't have data. We need to publish on, on it. But I think that, you know, as people are always looking for um, how to get better, we know that there isn't one right answer for everybody. I think it's important to note that this may be uh, a promising tool. So on that note, we're going to wrap up. I um, really appreciate you talking about this, also this issue of personalized therapy and how all the patients are, are potentially unique and have different stories and different modes of, of illness propagation and different treatments. And, and I think our challenge for all of us is, as we've heard about these great new um, treatments and progress is to figure out how we bring this and move this forward. How do we evaluate the successes? As Rich starts to point out, you know, we can do that, we can collect data, and how do we stimulate more research so that we can make these treatments uh, uh, mainstream, show which ones work best, which ones may not work, and really continue to bring science to our field to help our patients. So with that, we're gonna wrap up. Um, please stay tuned for a live Q&A that'll follow this panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alcott and Dr. Horowitz and Dr. Dempsey and Dr. Peterson for being with us today. We're here with a live Q&A and we only have a few, a few minutes, of course, we're keeping the program going. So with the time we have, we're just gonna kick it off. Our first question comes in from Kristen and she asks, given the tight connection between inflammation and Lyme treatment itself, um, given the tight connection between inflammation and Lyme, treatment itself can exasperate exacerbate inflammation, making it difficult for the meds to have an effect on the infection. Being more aggressive makes the situation worse. Overuse of curcumin and other anti-inflammatories can reduce immune system function. How do novel therapeutics address this conundrum? Dr. Horowitz? Yeah, Savvy, so thank you. So we have used curcumin, and I discussed it during the COVID talk that there are certain supplements that are called NRF2 activators, 
curcumin, broccoli seed extract, sulforaphane, glucosinolate, resveratrol, green tea. When we combine these with supplements that block NF-kappa B, like NAC, alpha-lipoic acid, glutathione, and then use zinc, vitamin D, melatonin, we find that we can lower the inflammatory response. And what we do with Herxheimer reactions from Lyme when people get worse is give the same treatment we gave for COVID, which is 2,000 milligrams of glutathione, either regular or liposomal glutathione. And we find that it works. And we've been using these with uh, treatments like Dapsone or Disulfiram, which have very good penetration into the CNS for people with neurological symptoms. The Dapsone protocol we're working on is an eight-week protocol. Uh, there's a new paper that should be published hopefully in the next two months. So we don't find that lowering inflammation is really a problem. We do it all the time for Herx's and people still get better when we do these treatments. Thank you. Uh, next question from Melissa. Um, are there any efforts to start human clinical trials for the triple therapy identified by Dr. Zhang? This combination treatment helped me and it may not be widely available yet. Dr. Alcott, would you mind addressing clinical trials? Yeah, there, there's a lot of excitement about taking things that have been shown in the laboratory or things that have been shown in, in um, case series or clinical practice and moving them into definitive treatment trials. A lot of excitement and, and frankly, a lot of possibilities. In addition to the one mentioned, there's other possibilities. And there's also ones we don't know about yet. Avi, in the last talk, um, mentioned how gene expression models may actually suggest new molecular therapy. So we're really excited. There's a pipeline of things to test, and we're, we're really chomping at the bits to, to uh, start uh, treatment trials and uh, really bring things all the way from the, the lab into things that are widely available to patients. It's, I think it's an exciting time thinking about that. This question comes in from Dr. Salati. Hello, hello, Tim. Nice to see you. Um, what exactly is being targeted in the spirochetes by SOT therapy? I can. Well, I can go ahead, Dr. Dempsey. Oh, we can share. We can share the answer. Um, but I would. I would say that SOT stands for supportive oligonucleotide therapy. Um, and it was a therapy that was originally designed for cancer um, and now has been sort of translated into um, the infectious disease world. And, um, you know, the way, the way, the best way to, to think about it is that if we just take Lyme, for instance, um, well, Lyme goes into your cells and it tries to take over the machinery of your cells to help it grow. And it does that through um, producing these. Uh, these RNA molecules, there's a whole system of DNA, RNA, things the way that, that cells multiply. What SOT does essentially is it's a, it's a protein, it's an oligonucleotide that's created in the lab based on the, uh, in, in the case of Lyme, based on the Borrelia that they found in your blood. And you're matching the DNA of the, um, they're, they're creating basically a, a partial DNA construct oligonucleotide to, to fit in like a, a lock and key into the messenger RNA from the from the line. So it's a way of sort of shutting down the replication, the multi multiplication of these um, of the infection. And so it seems like a therapy that could be used in, in conjunction with antibiotics, in conjunction with antimicrobials, but may actually help the process along. It's really, I think, still very new. Uh, we still need research on it. I started using it in my practice, um, and uh, but but I think it's exciting because we're talking about novel therapy, and so we you know we we have to we have to look at all these different pieces. The only thing I would add to that is that um, it actually was there there wasn't an, an SOT or gene silencing therapy in 1998. FDA approved for cytomegalovirus. The company that developed it eventually went out of business. There just wasn't a big market for it. So it was initially um, identified this, this um, anti-sense gene silencing for microbes. And then it was translated to cancer. And then it was translated back to microbes. Um, but there's lots of promise in this because essentially you're just shutting down the ability of the microbe to replicate by turning off the DNA replication cycle. One question that's come up a few times uh, today in various panels in various ways um, this one comes from Jeremy, who asks if we can please talk about mar medical marijuana for Lyme disease. Um, I, I can answer that if you'd like. Uh, briefly, um, I, it, I, 
there, there are reports that it specifically treats Lyme disease. I think it probably treats it in such a weak and ineffective fashion that as a treatment, it's not probably the best thing. But for a lot of the symptoms, it's quite effective. Um, and it just depends on the person because we all have CBD receptors and we all make CBD. Um, it's just a matter of do we have are, are, are our receptors not being stimulated enough? If that's the case, then CBD or THC, which binds stronger to the CD, CBD receptor, could help with symptoms of pain or anxiety. Um, but it's, it's patient dependent, like many of these things, um, to, to, to determine, it, is it appropriate for you to take? Will it help your pain or will it make you? I have patients who have um, great benefits and other patients who don't really find it useful. I would always start with CBD and then increase the THC if the CBD was ineffective. Um, we only have a few minutes left. And since I'm the one reading the questions, I'm going to ask this one just because I'm also curious about this. Anne asks to the panel, I'm always reading about CRISPR with other diseases. Is anyone in the Lyme community looking at gene deletion programs for Lyme treatment instead of you know, these gut-destroying treatments? Is CRISPR or gene editing being discussed in the Lyme community at all? It's being discussed in, in the preventive realm, uh, CRISPR on mice for trying to interrupt the zoonotic cycle of transmission is actually actively being discussed. Um, that's more CRISPRing on mice as a preventive. I'm not aware of on humans. I don't know if any of the other panel is aware on humans. I am. Yeah. No, just the bystone. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I, there are so many questions coming in. We're definitely not going to be able to get to them all. One thing that we as my mind are going to do is we're going to compile all of these questions and put together an FAQ document that we'll share on our website at a later date. And we'll go to all of these panelists and try and get some, some questions for you. So, um, so thank you. Thank you all for being here.